So uh, I want to talk about the evolution of spine surgery, but let's talk about the rest of life. So this is uh, Gordon Gecko's phone. He's the bad guy in Wall Street. You know, he's the big shot um, hedge fund guy that had, you know, that had the cell phone in the 1980s. And this is my iPhone. This is, it's more than a phone. It's basically a little mini computer. Um, the next picture is a picture of a surgical scar, okay? So in the 1980s, if you needed to get uh, a, 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 your ACL repaired or MCL repaired, you, you had to have a big cut from here to here. It took long, a long time to heal and rehab. And you can see that it's a, a somewhat painful incision. And today, uh, my partners, Dr. Cunningham, Dr. Sterrett, they, they just make little, little tiny puncture shots you know, with one little stitch that closes them. So like orthopedic surgery, like other parts of surgery, spine surgery is advancing, maybe not as fast, but um, I think for the better. So minimally invasive surgery has several distinct advantages. Um, smaller skin incisions, uh, which we're gonna talk about, less narcotic use afterwards, that's a big problem in our culture today is uh, opioid addiction and use. And if you're on a lot of narcotics, just to recover from the scar, there's an increased chance of maybe, uh, maybe making it a habit, which we wanna avoid. Um, there's less muscle disruption, so, le so improved uh, function, fewer infections, shorter operating room time with less blood loss, decreased length of stay in the hospital. A lot of my patients are going home the same day after surgery. Um, there's less anesthesia and um, faster recovery times when compared to traditional, uh, traditional open surgery. But the thing I want to make clear though, whether it's minimally invasive or conventional or open, the result at one to two years is the same. So the minimally invasive surgery has got to accomplish the same thing that an open surgery would. Now there's some downsides to minimally invasive surgery. It's, it's, not, all, it's not all cherries. Um, not everybody is a candidate for minimally invasive surgery. And we'll talk about who is, who is a good candidate. There's a steep learning curve for both, not only the surgeon, but the, my team, my operating staff. They, they also need to learn and get up to speed with um, MIS work. And because we're not making big incisions, we don't see what's going on, we use more x-rays than in traditional open surgery. So that means more radiation exposure um, for our team. It's not really a concern for the patient, but for a surgeon and operating room team that does um, surgeries three days a week, that, that radiation exposure can build up over time. So if you see me in the operating room, I'm dressed very differently. I have a lead apron on and also an apron to cover up my uh, thyroid, and that's just to protect me. I wouldn't make it a big concern for the patient because a limited exposure you know, for um, a, a surgery is, is really small compared to like doing it for a living day in and day out. Um, there's slower adoption, and some of that adoption is because it's newer to insurance companies, and so insurance companies are not always that uh, ready to approve these types of operations. I'm having a hard time getting my artificial discs approved and things like that, just because it's a newer technology, and they want to see more evidence and data behind it. And for that reason, I think there's a little bit slower uh, adoption, which I think is really unfortunate. Um, and Long-term outcomes are comparable or the same at one to two years with open surgery. So if you have an open surgery, usually the outcome later on is about the same. What I'm going for is trying to get you back to doing what you love sooner, faster, and safer, okay? So minimally invasive surgery can be done throughout the spine. Um, uh, in, the, in the cervical spine, we can do posterior outpatient um, fusions with uh, D-tracks. We'll talk more in detail about that. Artificial discs, microframinotomies. Uh, in the thoracic spine, we do uh, percutaneous or through the skin screws, uh, middle, middle uh, open uh, uh, thoracotomy, kyphoplasties for compression fractures, and also spinal cord stimulators. And I'll spend a lot of time about spinal cord stimulators and what, they, what that can mean. In the lumbar spine, we can even do surgery without general anesthesia. Um, we use uh, computer-assisted navigation or GPS for the spine. We uh, do minimally invasive surgeries uh, from a lot of different approaches that we'll talk about. And in the future, there's going to be endoscopic spine surgery and robotic spine surgeries. Those are, those are things that are coming down the road. So we'll talk about D-Tracks technology. It's a unique way to fuse the posterior spine. I, I usually use this technique not as a standalone, but to back up a conventional open front surgery. Um, this little um, spacer is about the size of a Tic Tac, and it goes into the facet joint, kind of limiting the motion. And you'll see opening up and decompressing the, uh, vertebra the, the vertebrae and the nerves that come out of it.
That's a little picture of it, and it's a really about the size of a Tic Tac. But when you insert this device, what happens is this foraminal height expands, and this is where the nerve leaves. Uh, this is a, um, a CT scan that's showing it being fused across. So symptom reduction through facet distraction, and then um, pre-op it's about 10 millimeters, 13 millimeters post-op. It stabilizes by fusing the facet joint and preventing uh, translation, or that's a type of motion. Uh, the fusion rates are actually pretty high, 90% in the first year, 98% uh, at year two. Uh, okay, this is kind of, this is a cartoon similar to that knee picture. The conventional way is to make an incision from here to here, and I sometimes do that, and um, put in what's called a lateral mass screws in the back. Um, the minimally invasive one, you make a much smaller incision, you go under the skin to put in these little um, shims or, or facet, uh, facet fusion devices about the size of a Tic Tac. Now the next picture is a picture of surgery, open surgery. So if you're not used to looking at surgery, you may not, I, I can go through it really quickly. But it looks something like this. this. This is the open surgery technique where we put in the screws and lateral mass. And this is what I was trained to do originally. This is a, a more recent at, um, version of technology, so it's only been around for a short period of time. But the, the, the tissue sparing approach is just these really small incisions. And so this is kind of comparable to that open knee you saw in the beginning versus the arthroscopic point. And this is, the, um, this is what they look like on an x-ray. Um, they go in with uh, a lot of x-rays. Um, when, when they go in, but they go in through this little uh, working channel or tube right here. And then this is some uh, data and literature uh, looking at 60 patients. And what I like to look at is the, uh, the pain score. So if, if 10 out of 10 is the worst pain, most of these patients started off at the baseline at seven and a half of uh, pain in their neck, uh, 7.4 in the arm, averaged out, and it goes from a seven to a two at two years out. Which should, be, which should be the same as if you do it open. Um, th uh, this is some uh, literature from the Journal of Neurosurgery. This is um, a society that I belong to that shows 93% um, bridging at a year. Let's go talk about artificial disc. Artificial disc, disc technology is motion preservation. Um, but I do counsel my patients that artificial disc is more like getting a Tesla as opposed to a Mercedes or a BMW. It's a newer piece of technology. I say that because nobody knows what the 10-year resale value is on a Tesla because it hasn't been long, around that long. We just don't know. If you want to know the 10-year resale value, you're, you may be better off with a more conventional approach like a, um, uh, a cervical fusion. The approach and the incision are all the, about the same, but the benefit for this is really helping the people in their second, third, fourth, and fifth decades of life with preventing adjacent segment disease. That's um, pressure on the um, biomechanical stress above and below the fusion level. And so we tend to think, though, if you're on your sixth, seventh, or eighth decades of life, you're, you may just be better, better off getting that BMW in, instead of getting a Tesla. Uh, one of my favorite operations to do, I learned in uh, Pittsburgh from one of the, the founders or one of the creators of minimally invasive surgery, Dr. Joe, J-H-O. And uh, this is a technique to um, go in and remove something that's pushing on the spinal cord or the nerve without an implant, just making a really small incision about the size of a suction. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about spinal cord stimulators. Um, chronic pain is becoming a, an epidemic. We'll talk more about that. But this is a way that we can put an electronic device that helps block the pain signals to, the, to your brain. It blocks your perception of brain. Of, of pain. So if, you, if the pain is the static on your radio, what this does is help turn down the volume. It doesn't, it, it doesn't address the underlying pathology, therefore there must not be a lot of underlying pathology before it be considered a, a candidate. An important thing that surprises a lot of patients is that there must be a preoperative psychological assessment, because pain is an experience. Your moods affect your pain. There's anxiety associated with pain, sometimes depression, hopelessness, or loss, and that needs to be treated for you to be a good candidate. And that's why I put everybody through a psychological assessment. And some people are, are surprised at that. It's not that I think that um, you, you, you need a psychiatrist, it's just that I wanna know what your mental health is before you undergo something, and this is only for pain. So I was saying that chronic pain is an epidemic. Roughly 8% of the population suffers from chronic um, pain, and it's very disabling. They're not able to work, and it's, it's a problem for the patient as well as our society.
Oftentimes, they're treated with narcotic medications and they can get addicted or hooked on those kind of medications. And this is a, a one way to help reduce the amount of narcotics. My goal is to get you off all of them. That's my goal. And uh, the cost of society is $600 billion. That's a lot of money. So when you're treating chronic pain, you start with the pills, the phar pharmacologic uh, therapy, lifestyle changes, physical therapy, or you might see uh, um, some of my colleagues like Dr. Rob or Dr. Evans, um, maybe doing some pain blocks, epidural injections or other injections, and then it comes to surgery. If the surgery fails, we talk about spinal cord stimulators. Right now, we're not doing any pain pumps up here, just putting, uh, putting in morphine because I, I think it um, makes the problem worse. I do have one exception where I'll put a pain pump in somebody to just inject them with morphine, is if they have terminal cancer and they don't have a long life expectancy. And rather than taking pills, if they, or if they can't swallow, I'll just put in the pain pump. And that's just as um, a mercy surgery or palliative surgery, okay? Um, this is some um, strong data showing, this is what the, the studies that were required to get FDA approval. FDA approval uh, happened in 2015, so this has only been around for about two years. There's a former version of this ever since the 1980s, but the newest version, which is high frequency, which is paresthesia free, has only been around for a couple years. Um, we're, HF10 is 10,000 kilohertz, spinal cord simulator, and I, in my, in my hands, in my opinion, I like it better than the conventional forms, although I do both, um, because you don't feel any paresthesias. Um, paresthesias are this uh, kind of buzzing or numbing, um, tingling sensation that you may have had with like a TENS unit or something. Sometimes it's hard to sleep with those, with those things going on. And so this, is, this works at such a high, right, like a hummingbird flapping their wings, that you don't actually perceive the paresthesias, but it's still working. But everybody, is, it's a try before you buy type model. Everybody has to have a trial with a stimulator before they get the implant. So this is what some of the um, devices look like. This is, it, um, is uh, designed to help control the programs and the amount of stimulation that you get. This is the charger with a pad that goes on the implantable generator. And that's, that's about the size of a pacemaker battery. So you have to live with a pacemaker battery. Some common questions. Will I feel anything? You should not feel anything, unlike traditional spinal cord therapies. There's the, no tingling or buzzing sensations. Is it, is it reversible? Yes, so you can remove the leads. Um, but it does require a surgery to remove the leads. Can you turn off devices if you need to? You can. And can you have an MRI? This is probably the most important thing, is once you get this stimulator implanted, just like getting a pacemaker, you can't get an MRI of your trunk. You can get one of your brain and of your elbows, hips, no, Chris, not the hips, but the knees and the ankles, but not of, the, not of your trunk once you have this in. So um, this, the, what this means is, you know, uh, more increased functional activity, more freedom, and less pain. Um, patient satisfaction has shown that uh, um, if 20% if were severely crippled, that number goes down to 2%. If 71% had severe disability, weren't able to work, that goes down to 35%. And then um, uh, minimal symptoms is 17%. People still have some pain, but my goal is to take you from that seven or eight out of 10 to two or three. That's the goal. Um, this is my actual patient data. So none of my patients had prior spinal cord stimulators. 67%, most people have, the back, have back pain. 22% leg pain, and other is usually like foot or groin pain. So in my, in my experience, this is my own personal data, 91% responded and 9% didn't respond to the stimulation. If eight, eight out of 10 with pain was the average pre-op score, um, after the trial it was 1.2, okay? With 10 being the worst pain, and obviously zero being no pain at all. So it doesn't make you zero, but in, in my hands it's 1.2, but I, I would be happy if that was uh, up, even up to two, one to 2%. Um, and then, this is the, each, each patient in terms of how much relief they had after the surgery. And I did have two lucky patients that had 100% relief, 90%, 60%. This one patient only had 30% relief, therefore I did not put it in. It's gotta be at least 50% or more for you than they get the permanent stimulator. So if, they're, if you're at 30%, it's not enough improvement to, to go undergo the, the permanent implant. And that number is really determined by the patient, because I just asked the patient, what's, what's your pain score on a scale of one to 10? All right, so um, in, in, in calling 77,000 patients, 
this is not just my patients, but it's all patients nationally, 80%, 83% were likely to recommend, uh, likely or very likely to recommend um, a spinal cord stimulator. 86% cited improvement. 86 had um, failed other types of spinal cord stimulators in the past. None of my patients had other spinal cord stimulators in the past. And then 84% used that remote that I showed you earlier less than once per week. But you can use it more often to change the programs if you need to. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about spine surgery without general anesthesia. Some of my um, patients are really surprised to know that I can do this, the operation without putting them all the way to sleep. I talk during the operation, I tell them I give them a few skinny margaritas so they're more relaxed, and then they get the surgery done. We studied this and we showed that there was decreased nar narcotic use and length of stay when you didn't have to go under general anesthesia to go all the way to sleep. And it makes a big difference if you've got a bad heart or bad ticker because the anesthetic can be really, we say going to sleep, but it's not, you're not really asleep. Your heart's going a mile a minute. You're under all, all these drugs to um, stop you from being conscious. And we're just keeping, the anesthesiologist is supporting your, your, your breathing because you're not breathing on your own with um, a, a respirator or a ventilator. Um, I think it's uh, safer, faster, and it has fewer risks, is the bottom line. But I want to show you an illustrated case. Now, this is a 25-year-old woman that came to our office. She had failed chiropractic care. She had intractable pain, and no wonder, because she had this big disc herniation. Um, these are normal discs in her, but you can see this one is, is pushing on her nerve. That's where it was. And so the conventional way is to put her to sleep and make a big incision, but we didn't do that on her. This next one shows I do an epidural block, putting in um, pain medication around the nerves. We use this little dilator tube. Next slide has um, a, what her disc looks like. So if you're not used to looking at what your real disc like, this is what it is. It has a little bit of blood on it, so just be prepared. <clears throat> and so that's her incision, and that's a that disc herniation that you saw on the MRI. The patient was awake during the surgery, and she said, what are you guys looking at? And I said, your disc. She said, well, show it to me. So I showed it to her. She, I asked her permission to use her uh, picture in the talk. So her picture's in here. She's like, whoa. <laughs> but we, we hide our identity. That's actually Holly's arm, I think. Is that your arm, Holly? <laughs> so I want to talk about one of my favorite topics, because there's a new way to do fusions when they're necessary. I don't like to do fusions, but when they're necessary, I try to make them as minimally invasive as possible. So there are a lot of different approaches to the spine. The spine is actually in the middle. And you have to think about what tissues you're going through to so get the operation done, whether you're going back through these back muscles, through a T-lift, through these other muscles. And I do these operations commonly, too. But a newer one is to come in from the front. And you kind of the only muscles you have to go through are these three muscles on, your, on the outside of your abdominal wall. That's called the O-lift. Um, you have to be very mindful of the anatomy. We'll talk all, a little bit about all the different structures that you have to be mindful of. Um, this is a... Uh, uh, kind of what the retractors look, whether you do an O-lift down here or an O-lift down here. The retractors are here and you're trying to stay away from these blood vessels, but also stay away from your muscles. So this is technique was first described in 2012 with 179 patients and it showed um, nice, nice release comparable to the conventional techniques. Um, they further uh, modified it and improved it in 2015. You can see that this foraminal height is improved or increased with this, um, with this fusion device. And then in, in 2015, they showed no spinal nerve injuries, no major vessel injuries, no peritoneal injuries, as they continue to refine the retractors in the system that goes in. Uh, another study from 2015 showing 133 patients and showing where the, in, the inner body goes in. And again, a lot, some of these talks I use with other doctors. They want to see what is the study, what evidence do you have, and this is the evidence to show that it's safe. 2016, this is the version that I use today with the, the Medtronic system. So I like this slide because um, it really shows the muscle, the corridor on a, on a scan. So this, this muscle highlighted over here are just the muscles of your abdominal wall. This is where the O-lift goes through, but the, um, the lateral or X-lift or lateral lumbar body fusion has got to go through this muscle called the psoas. If you get the psoas muscle in a butcher shop, they call it a filet mignon. That's, what it, that's the muscle of it. This is a backstrap muscle that the, the PLIF or the T-lift has got to go through. Um, I'll move through this slide. This just shows that you can do it at all levels. 
I think this is a really interesting slide because it shows how your abdominal wall contents go off to the side when you lay on your side. So this is the same person, and they, got, they volunteered to get a CAT scan laying down. You can see this is their abdominal contents here. And when they lay to the side, it just falls over. So it makes it really easy for a surgeon or neurosurgeon to kind of come in here to do the fusion. Uh, again, and this shows the, how the, we put the retractors in to uh, minimize any, um, any injury to your organs here. Um, and this surgery can be done in, in literally an, about an hour to an hour and a half. Everybody benefits. Everybody wins. But one of my big rules, and I've always told this to my team, is failing to plan is planning to fail. So we, you have to make sure that the patient is a great candidate. And that starts with um, making sure that their, their size, they're th thinner, the larger they are, the harder it is to do this operation. Um, if they've had colon cancer restrictions or prior surgery, they're not a good candidate for this operation. And you want to um, look at, see if they have diabetes or difficulty breathing before you consider doing any kind of operation like this. You get x-rays to see if they're a good candidate. You um, learn where all their bony anatomy is. Oh wait, this is a, another surgery. You guys ready for another surgery picture? It's, I think it's one of my last ones. <laughs> so here, this is what the inner body looks like. That's what the cage looks like. And we have the retractors in to prevent the ureter, the, um, the blood vessels, and this is really the look I get while I'm in surgery. And you have to think in three dimensions when you do this operation. And that's why we, um, I want to showcase a nice piece of technology that Vail Health has called the OR, or Computer Assisted Surgery. It's often, um, it's le less invasive, and I think it makes the operations way safer. So this is a standard, my standard um, protocol is to use the OR. But you can think of it like a GPS for, for the surgeon. And you get a lot of, a series of computer shots and computer screens. So we start with a navigation planning, which, which is over here. You, look, you know where the blood vessels are. You know your target, the disc. You know the psoas muscle, which you want to avoid. And this is your entry point. And then p people are surprised to see that I don't even look at the patients while I'm operating on them. Um, my head is looking at the, p the computer screen like a video game. Okay, and we're localizing where the disc is, where the pathology is. We have special uh, uh, instruments that when I move it, it moves on the, on the co computer screen. That's what this little antenna is for. Um, sorry, I'm clicking too fast. Um, this is the picture, the kind of a cartoon of the picture, but you can see what the, the um, tools I use to get into the disc are. And they all have these little um, dots on here so that I can navigate it with the GPS. Okay, and then, I, and then I'm looking at the screen. I don't look at the patient. I'm looking where my shavers go. I'm looking where the trial goes. This is a history of the, the trial to see what size implant you need. And then this is what the implant looks like. And I just follow that in. Navigated um, all, all with the computer. And it makes everything far more safer than just using uh, regular x-rays that don't have a 3D, a three-dimensional picture. So if any of you guys are signed up for this surgery, hopefully this gives you some more reassurance that it's going to be done safely. And I think some, of the, some people in the room maybe even signed up for the surgery already. Um, so that, what, what that comes down to is you can do really big operations with navigation. This is a surgery I did while still in San Antonio. This is not up in Vail, but this is a guy with lung cancer that has spread to his bones. He, he was literally um, paraplegic, couldn't walk. We used this system to remove that bone, and we put in this implant here and stabilize it with screws. This doesn't cure his lung cancer, but it allows his last, his last days to be walking with his family. And we know that once you're bedridden, um, you uh, usually only have a few weeks to live once you're bedridden. Uh, endoscopic surgery uh, is something coming down the um, the, pat, uh, uh, the future. We hope to get this uh, equipment at some point at Vail. This is equip. This is these are pictures I did while I was in the military. Um, <clears throat> the incision is only about a centimeter or so, and you get a really nice picture. You're working underwater like a knee scope. You see the nerves, you see the disc, and you're able to decompress things. Um, I also. I also decided to push it and see what if I could do a fusion through a small incision. This is a, a fusion through a really small one centimeter incision. Like I said, this is something that I hope to come down, will come here in the future, but it's experience that I have in the military and I hope to bring it up here uh, in the near future. Um, 
This is our, our contact information. I think Susan's here to help give you contact information. I also want to point out uh, Molly Casey's in the audience. She's my uh, fiance, and we'd like to thank you to welcoming us, welcoming us to the community. We've been in Texas for 10 years, so we're still getting used to all this white stuff on the ground, but uh, we're having a lot of fun with it. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I, like, I really want to give a hand to Vail Health for putting this together to uh, allow me to have this venue and let you guys know about the great things we're doing.